Please be seated. So I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, I'm sure many of you are thinking I look older than that, but uh, really I, you know, I came in uh, in the 80s and I was one of those kids that, uh, that was exposed to a lot of movies that had the Soviets as the bad guys, like Red Dawn. And I remember the heroes were defending America against, uh, against all of that red fear. Uh, and uh, Rocky IV, where the, uh, uh, the enemy was this indomitable uh, Russian fighter. And when we played uh, in the backyard and we made tree forts, the enemy that we were always fighting against <coughs> was always the Soviets. <coughs> That was the way it had been set up for us. Uh, they were the evil force and we were the good. And I remember Sting coming up with a song and I was pretty young at the time, I don't know how old I was, but uh, <clears throat> in it he talks about the, uh, the Russians loving their children too. And I remember the fact that that thought had never ever occurred to me. I hadn't even pictured Soviet children at that point in time. <clears throat> All I'd pictured was uh, was us versus them. That's really, it was somewhat monolithic, but all of a sudden I realized that maybe they were people. Maybe it wasn't just two big countries up against each other, but that they were actual uh, mothers and children and, uh, and, and people just like me playing the same games uh, with different uh, enemies and different good guys across the pond. It's like that in a lot of different things. Whether or not it's our enemy or whether it's not just somebody who's different and far away, we can become blind or we can prejudice ourselves uh, to the other. As we uh, watch uh, what's going on half a world away or as we don't watch, uh, I was struck by how distant what's taking place in Syria can, uh, can seem. As I was watching a, a video, uh, the newsreel caught a video of uh, Syrian refugees uh, landing in Greece, and it was at the, in the black of night, uh, and it was this father who had been separated from his children uh, in the voyage, and, uh, and as he's on European soil, uh, he finally recognizes his son and daughter, and he runs up to him, and he's got tears just streaming down as he throws his arms around him, and he says, my love, my life, uh, we're here, we're in Europe, we're free. And, I, and he goes to his son and he wraps his arms around him and you see the love of a parent for a child uh, and, and all of the hopes that you have for your child wrapped up and all of a sudden it wasn't half the world away. It was inside my household with what I feel for my children. Uh, and I think that the more often we set up us versus them, the more often we forget that. Uh, and the most profound thing is that I think it can happen to anybody even Jesus. I think our faith demands that we wrestle with this story, that we come to some sort of account of the story that we hear today. It is one of the most powerful and surprising stories in all of Scripture. It somewhat violates the ideas we like to have of Jesus. Jesus doesn't respond like that beautiful stained glass window holding the, uh, the, the little uh, the baby sheep. Jesus responds with a stinging insult. But let's go back to the story. So remember a few weeks ago or several weeks ago, Jesus is trying to escape the madness. <coughs> he has sent his disciples out on missionary journeys. They've come back. They're filled with enthusiasm. They want to talk about what they experienced. And Jesus says, we need to retreat together. We need to go on retreat. So Jesus uh, goes to the other side uh, uh, of the Sea of Galilee to, uh, to retreat, and before he even gets there, people are there in mass by the thousands. And he has compassion for them. He has pity for them. He feeds them. Uh, and then he says, okay, and he speaks to them, and he preaches, and he heals, and then he begins to go across the water again to try to escape, and they get back before he does. And they bring them, they're, uh, they're sick, and they're poor, and they're tired, and, and, he, and he heals them, and he, and he fills them, and he continues uh, 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 to imbue grace and healing upon them, but he is wiped out. He's exhausted, and then he challenges the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and this is the last part right before today's story. And I'll tell you, Mark does this beautiful thing, this beautiful literary device, as simple as some of his language is. He often places a story, they call it uh, inclusio or a mark and sandwich, where he puts the story in uh, between another story that informs that middle story. 
So pay attention to what's before and what's after. So before today's story takes place, the last thing out of Jesus' mouth is his challenge to the Pharisees and the Sadducees that is not what we eat. It's not all the dietary laws that matter to God. It's what comes out of our mouth. It's our actions uh, and the words that we share with one another. Those are the things that defile. The last word before today's story. Jesus again tries to retreat. He goes, and he goes uh, far enough away that, that he's not even known in the place that he goes. He goes outside of, of, of his own uh, confines. He goes outside of, uh, of where he, he's likely to find Jews, uh, to Gentile lands, and he finds a room, and he's finally going to have retreat. He's exhausted. He has been ministering and ministering, and even Jesus says, I need a place to lie my head. I need to pray and fill up my, uh, my batteries so that I can go and minister. Uh, and he's finally gone outside of his own comfort zone to a new place so that he can rest. And people see him, and they notice who he is. And word spreads, and a woman comes to him. And the woman is not of his tribe. In fact, uh, the Jews didn't like the Syrophoenicians, largely because the Syrophoenicians were Gentile, they didn't practice the law, and they were privileged. So if you feel like you might be a privileged Gentile, you might want to listen carefully to this exchange. Uh, if you're part of the richest country the world has ever known, this may be uh, uh, worth listening to. So this woman, who, who, how could she have any problems? She's in the power uh, system. She's got, a, she's got wealth. What could be her problem? Remember those barriers? So she comes to Jesus, and she doesn't just come to Jesus. She, the most shocking thing is not what comes out of Jesus' mouth, uh, but that this woman would come unchaperoned by a male, throw herself at the feet of Jesus, speak directly to him. The, the number of, of, of social laws that have been violated are huge. But she throws herself at Jesus' feet, She's on all fours at the feet of Jesus, and instead of Jesus, the, the beautiful uh, cherubim face uh, holding the sheep saying, my child, what can I do to make you well? He says, is it fair for me to take what's for the children of Israel and give it to the dogs? Now remember, dogs aren't cute pets in this time. Uh, dogs are scavengers that carry disease. That's, I mean, that's a reviled word to call somebody. It's nasty. Jesus is human. Jesus is exhausted. And Jesus is a product of 30 years in his own town. One of the beautiful things about the incarnation is that God indeed became flesh and bore all of what it is to be human, to be blind, to be wrong. And this desperate mother says to Jesus, looks Jesus in the eye and says, but don't even the dogs get the scraps under the table? Isn't there anything left for my daughter? Isn't there anything? And that's when Jesus is broken open. He's opened up. And Jesus says, your faith has made your, your daughter well. Go home and you'll find her well. And Jesus' understanding of the expanse of God's love of where God sent him to go is expanded and broken open. All the way across the globe, all the way across 2,000 years to us sitting in the pews today, it's broken open. And if we want to be assured that in fact it was broken open, the beautiful next story that doesn't seem to fit with the previous story is about Jesus opening. Jesus continues his journey back uh, towards more, more, more Jewish confines, and he uh, uh, is at Decapolis, and uh, a man who uh, uh, has no ability to speak uh, and is deaf uh, comes to him, was brought to him, and in an incarnational, incarnational way, Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears. He spits and he touches his tongue, and he says, Ephphatha opened. Be opened. And it informs that story in the middle. It's what comes out of our mouth that defiles. Then the story. And then Jesus' words, be opened. So wherever you are in life, whatever your bias, whatever place that you can't see, God calls us to be opened. 
is James uh, invites us to make sure that we care for the poor and see the poor in the same way that we see the rich. Jesus' story reminds us that we can be every bit as biased towards those whose lives look perfect, who seem to have more than us and more than they need. That God's love is for everybody and that the needs spread broadly. So wherever your bias is, wherever you can't see past, and it's not just a matter of having compassion. As we get from the letter of James, we are called to act. That our faith calls us to figure out where we need to be open. And then to go. And to work. And to love. And to expand God's vision. To open it up to new places. Amen.